Here we go. It says recording in Whoa, process. Oh, it says that's now. new. That is kind of freaky. Well, just okay. think of all the reasons you would want to know that. <laughs> I know, but that was kind um, of freaky. Okay. So I do consultations for an hour, well, really for about two hours with some individuals and couples that struggle. And uh, I've done a couple of consultations recently, all in a row. And I have had this experience where, I don't know how to say this the right way, where a wife is married to a really bad man. You know, some people are just not good people. And in one of the cases, I ran into someone who had justified, rationalized, and figured out why all the sex he wanted to have was okay in or out of his marriage. And the other one was just a bad guy. And it made me sad that these women were fighting so hard, these partners. I know they had kids. I know they had family life. I know they see love in that man. But sometimes, you know, no matter how much love, nor another woman I work with, she thought that sex addiction treatment would solve all the problems. No, it's just beginning to look at underneath the problems. So I guess, you know, I don't have an answer for this, Tammy. I know you run into this if you have a comment. God knows I love everybody who calls and reaches out. And I never try, you know, I'm pro relationships as much as I write books about it. But there are times when if you don't get out of there, your needs are never going to be met. Time's going to go be by and you're going to have that kid who says, oh, I wish my parents hadn't stayed together. So I don't know if we have an answer or when the right time is or, but I see people who've spent year after year, therapy after therapy, you know, issue after issue, and they're still waiting for it to get better. And it's just not going to get better. So do you have any thoughts at Tammy before we move on? I do. And, and I, and I agree with you, like as much as I'm pro relationship, and, but I, I'm pro healthy relationship. I'm not pro unhealthy relationship that is toxic right. for, you know, where somebody is, you know, at the mercy of this other person's actions and, you know, and the chaos. And, you know, I mean, I talk to a lot of partners who have physical ailments, you know, that are struggling with, you know, some form of issue because, and I'm sure that there's, it's related to all the chronic trauma that they are under and it's sad. So I always want to encourage people who want to get help. I'll, I'll do a lot to help people get the right help to, so that they can heal. But there are some people who stubbornly just absolutely refuse. And I, I always think it's sad that addiction wins, you know, when, when it's addiction, sometimes it's mental health. You've shared that, you know, as well, but you know, when addiction wins and people just dig in and they don't want to change, I have talked to partners before. And I said, vision this, if you know, you've been doing this for two and a half years in another year, if things are exactly the same way, is that okay? I mean, if it is no judgment, if, you know, but if, if that's okay, you know, so so fine. Well, in and, two and a half years, if it's still the same way, are you going to be sitting there thinking, oh, I wish I would have, you know, left, you know, back in the day? I don't know. I, I think, you know, when it's the right time, but you have to get some outside feedback, a, a lens that isn't so in the, in the weeds, you know, cause you're you sitting there doing this. Yeah. 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 That's true. So I, I had two more notes that I wrote down about that. Um, one is that, you know, I, I thought, if we take the sex out of it, the cheating, out, if we take all of that out of it and we just say, let's make your husband an alcoholic or your wife an alcoholic. So they're sitting there and they're drinking like a fish and they're getting drunk in front of you, in front of your children. How long? And maybe, you know, acting out, maybe they yell, they scream, they break things or they just pass out in their chair. How long would you want your children to see their dad, you know, that man drinking to that degree? How long would you feel safe in your home with an active addict? And I think that's easier for uh, partners to get rather uh, because when it ends up being about sex addiction, there's betrayal, there's other issues that come into it, you know, all of that. But if you could look at it like the person is smoking, you know, crack every day, and, you know, it wouldn't really be that different emotionally. And, you know, and, yeah. So the other thing is just to say this, um, there, it's hard for partners to accept, I guess. Well, here's what I wanted to say. One of the things I said to these folks, if, if it's really difficult for you to say, I don't want to be here, or I can't be here or any of that, what does it do to your child? You know, if you're anxious all the time, if you're fearful all the time, if you're checking computers and phones and at a certain point, you know, is that really giving your kids what they need? And, uh, and I think that's something to think about because a lot of partners think I'm traumatized and I'm doing my best to protect my kids. And I hope, I hope, 
But just because you're traumatized, then they're traumatized. And how long do you want to sit in that trauma panic state around your kids before you don't want them to be exposed to your anxiety or what's this person is going in and out or all of that? And I can't answer that for you. I just want to ask you, if not your pain and trauma, you know, what about your kids? Yeah. So yeah. that's, I'm done. I'm, this is and not what a lecture, are you modeling? No, no, no. But like, yeah, I mean, what, what are you yeah, what modeling? Are you modeling? I, yeah. Yeah. When I get out of a toxic relationship, I was like, is this what I want for my daughter? And I was like, heck no, I do not want her to think that this is okay. So like, that was my wake up call, honestly. So, and I have to say one more thing, Tammy, so many of the people we work with, they had situations like this going on in the home, but no one talked about it you know, dad was gone, dad was, and I'm not saying you have to tell your kids you're a sex addict, sex addict, but nothing was talked about, like mom and dad having problems or arguing, it's just it all took place in front of them, and those become my patients, those become the drug addicts, because all this stuff happened, their emotion, they felt it in their home, all those cortisol levels, but no one's talking, but no one's saying this is why, no one's explaining it to the intellectual part of their brain, and that's how people get screwed up, so anyway, no harm, no foul, thank you for giving me the time, I just, that's been on my mind, I appreciate you sharing. So I put the first question in answered. Married 38 years coming up on second D-Day after eight years of acting out with sex workers. At first, he seemed so relieved to give this up, but now he has very little libido and seems content with just getting affection and being held after a lifetime of porn addiction. Could this be part of his brain rewiring itself, trying to be patient and understanding, but it's hard. Okay, so this is a long answer. I'm writing it down so I don't forget. So part of the problem is that you have to understand as active sex addict, I am approaching sex through intensity. I can't wait to be with that person. We're gonna hide it. We're gonna, it's gonna be an affair. It's gonna, I'm gonna make the sex worker love me. I mean, this is the best porn in the world. Whatever it is, it's met with excitement and heart beating, you know, all of that stuff. Um, and new, right? New images, new people, new experiences. And by the way, if you're having an affair, that person never has to do the laundry or take care of the kids or gain 30 pounds. So it's all new. But sex with a partner, as many of you women know, I think, doesn't come from hot, new, exciting, you know, and as a man, it's like, I've seen that butt before, it's been 20 years. So if we're going to be sexual, it has to come from a different place of really connecting. And, you know, my spouse and I, we lie down, we, you know, oil, relaxing, kissing, and guess what? It was amazing. Here's the problem. Sex addicts have an intimacy problem. We, this is an intimacy disorder. It is much easier for a sex addict to go to a stranger and have an intimate feeling experience over which they have control because no sex worker or porn is ever going to let them down or hurt them. But when they come close to you, it's terrifying because you either remind us of the mothers who overwhelmed us or we're terrified that you'll abandon us or whatever it is. So we keep you at a distance. And by the way, emotionally and sometimes sexually. So here's the deal. When we put all of that craziness down, and I hope he has, we turn to you and you're not intense. You're not, I'm not saying you're not exciting, but not in that way, like a strip club. And since we have an intimacy problem, what we tend to do in our relationships is then avoid sex. We like the cuddling and all that, but we're scared to death of the kind of emotional merging that happens when you have sex. Otherwise, we would have had it with you all along. So we split our lives into sexual acting out, intimacy, home, and relationship because we can't on some level level, tolerate putting the two together. Um, And what often happens, and Tammy will say this, she gets like, wait, he stopped acting out or she stopped, really, she stopped acting out. Now we never have sex. I would have thought when the stop that it would have gotten better. I would say this is the under the iceberg part. Um, It's also a good thing to talk to about a good couples therapist or sexologist. There are many methods. I mean, I'm a sexologist. I know this. Yes, they give you degrees in sex. (laughs) Some people don't know that. Um, And they can guide you through all kinds of exercises and activities because there's a lot of, I know when I studied it, there was a lot about what if someone has trauma and they back away from sex? Or they, how do you move man or woman? How do you move them toward more connection in a safe and comfortable way the person can have control? Or So I do think there are skill sets that can be brought to this, but I'll give you my ultimate answer, which is you can write this one down. I love this. And I didn't make it up. Omar did. Um, when, you are se- when you're in recovery and you're with a partner, that sex for us sex addicts has to come from willingness, not horniness. 
So I'm just not going to be, you know, men are very visually oriented. That's why we like porn and strip, you know, it's our thing. We like to look and I'm not going to be visually stimulated as much as I love you. I'm not going to be visually stimulated by someone I've been with for 13 years, but I will get stimulated by the emotions. If I let my, if I'm willing to lie down with you, to massage you, to kiss you. The thing is my first, and this is true. My husband's not in the room. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there he's going away now. Um, I would rather read the paper than have sex with him. And it's not about him. It's just my first reaction is to move away. Like I'm busy, I have something to do. It's not on my mind. I don't feel like it. I wanna be held, I wanna be connected. But that sex part is like, oh, I'd rather do this because I'm scared. Um, and when I move toward with willingness instead of away, cause you don't make me horny, that's the answer to your question. If he's working a program, now he's running into the underlying problem of intimacy. Whew, that was a lot. That was a lot, but it was fantastic. So, okay. So the next question is how can my essay partner go from seeing prostitutes to having an affair for 18 months? How can the day in day out communication with the affair partner be compartmentalized? I understand seeing prostitutes, you have sex with them and you're done, but talking to them every day and seeing them once or twice a week is very hard to understand. I, I understand escalation, but an affair relationship is so different to me. I think that that's, that's a common question. So, Well, there's two questions I'd like to tackle one. And I really wish, especially as a woman, you would tackle the other. Okay. And the one I'm going to talk to you, ask you to tackle is what's the difference between someone to, to uh, for a woman between someone who's having casual sex and someone who has an affair. I'd love you to talk about that. But I want to say sadly to you that I don't think this man is telling telling the truth. And most of the men I work with have affairs and see prostitutes or they turn one of the sex workers into an affair. So while they're seeing other sex workers, many of the men I work with will say, oh, it's if it's not my wife, it's her or not my husband, it's it's him only to realize when they go to the next person and discard their current relationship, they're still seeing sex workers. So it doesn't. And of course, you know, it not about you. So um, and the, yeah, I just and for when I'm reading this and the way it feels, I bet this person has not had a formal disclosure, as I'm guessing, or they've not gone through the process. But most of all, I think the questions you're asking are too specific. And I think there's a more general problem here that I bet there's a lot you don't know. It's my guess. Tammy? And please don't ask him for the details because like, <laughs> like, yeah, that, that is like, I call it a vomit disclosure where you just get details. I was just answering an email right before I got on here and somebody said, I got breadcrumbs. You know, it's like, I keep getting little pieces of it and she is so traumatized. And I was like, yes, because you just don't know when the next breadcrumb is going to, it's going to be a brick, but it, you know, it's going to hit. And, and so, so getting that information in, in a, Therapeutic disclosure, you know, is a much more humane way of for you to receive the information. But it also, like, I'm wondering, um, uh, like, if he has any, like, has he stopped the behavior? Where is he at with all of that type of thing? But as far as, I mean, I've had partners who are of uh, guys who are just sex addicts, and I use air quotes on that, and they're like, I, you know, it feels like I shouldn't be as traumatized by that as you know, what, you know, what an emotional affair or a physical affair, or whatever it is. And, and, and it's all cheating. It all hurts. You know, it all hurts in the same place, you know, so the degree of, you know, what he's doing, um, and, you know, and I get, uh, so I can tell you about compartmental, I, that was the word I picked up on is compartmentalization. It's really easy to put this in a compartment and go, oh, it doesn't touch any of this. As long as no one else finds out, I can do this. But I'm also thinking the affair is not, you know, that's not a vulnerable and intimate relationship like Dr. Rob was just describing in the last question. That is, again, contractual. I'm meeting, getting my needs met. I'm, you know, paying for sex. I'm doing, it's, it's transactional, it's intensity, it's, you know, it's the high risk behavior, et cetera. So it is still not a connected, intimate relationship. I do think it's harder for partners when they perceive that there is some intimacy when it's a longer term thing than it, when it's simply transactional. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all cheating and it's all painful, you know, for you. So, so just looking at those and going, how can he do that? He cheated on you. He was unfaithful. He's, you know, he's hurt you and it's all goes in the same pot of hurt. So. I will say one more thing, though, just to add to that. And thank you, Tammy, because you're right. It's all the same on some level. And I just see, 
And by the way, if you want to see your lives in 1986, go see Fatal Attraction. Find a way to see it because if you see how that affair is carried out, Michael Douglas, yeah. I mean, really, you look back to the late Blank 80s close, and it's yeah. like he did all of that. He did partial disclosure. He he lied to her, you know, and, and he was lying about what he was doing with the woman. I mean, it all plays out. Sorry if it's a really good movie. Um, I just want to say that. And, and the reason I thought of that is because, you know, I, I show a clip when I teach. Right. And the clip has a woman who's just realized her husband's having having sex with other with another woman and she looks at him and she's terrified and she says you know okay you're having sex you're having you're doing this do you love her and so the next level down for this person was like okay i can kind of handle if it's just sex especially casual sex but if you have feelings for her that's a threat to my home to everything we've ever talked about you know and i think it goes down the heart i mean it goes down into the gut a little further because um, it's a whole different level of threat. But on the other hand, as Tammy said, you see it that way. But from our perspective, it's all it all screws you guys up. Um, and plus, they do it for the same reasons, even though it means different things to you. Thanks, Tammy. What's the so next? The nec next question. She's constantly watching my every move to protect herself from further trauma. I know this is normal, but not healthy for her. Is there more um, I can do besides maintaining our boundaries to help her feel safe? Yes. You can buy a book I wrote called Out of the Doghouse, A Relationship Saving Guide for Men Caught Cheating. Out of the Doghouse, A Relationship Saving Guide for Men Caught Cheating. And the reason that I recommend the book is not just because I'm going to make a lot of money because as Tammy knows, publishers don't pay me much. But this is one of the few books that I've seen written from a man to men because I've had so much experience with betrayed partners. We don't get your pain. We don't understand the depth of your pain. And men are problem solvers. I mean, we like to fix things, but your betrayal, we don't know how to fix because we underestimate it. We think, oh, well, they'll get over it in this amount of time or they won't, you know, or we don't understand it and we underestimate it. So what I wrote for guys is, you know, if you want to be in this relationship, if you, then you have a lot of work to do and you're not equals in this relationship, you're in the doghouse. And this is what you have to do to get back in the house. And it's very much don't say this, do say this, because, you know, maybe we can talk these guys into empathy by practicing it and then they feel the good of it. And, you know, but they're not going to know what to do or say. Um, and there's something else about this. I, I would really be curious. Um, how long has this person been sober? How long have you been working on it? How one of the things that's in doghouse is, you know, a lot of what you can control about your spouse's response is doing your part and them not, you know, the spouse who has to say, well, did you go to therapy this week? Or have you been to meetings? I haven't, that's not good. We're supposed to come to you and say, I just want to let you know, I went to these meetings and we are supposed to reassure you. So that kind of thing's not going on. Maybe there's some things you can institute to make her feel more safe. Yeah, that, and I also am not sure what support she has. Um, we, we, I was just emailing before we got on here too with someone and she commented on how uh, she joined our Betrayed Partner Groups and to get the level of support to see other people who are in a similar situation was really helpful for her. So I'm wondering if your wife has been able to, I hope, hopefully she's on here, but hopefully she reaches out and joins some of the Betrayed Partner Groups as well. So uh, gets that level of support. And perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, you, and you said we're maintaining our boundaries. So like, you know, the boundaries, like I'm curious and if boundaries are well done, then they create safety. So, so you know, but continuing to honor those, not lying about anything, you know, that's how you start to be, rebuild trust. So next question. I know we always say healing from SA takes anywhere from three to five years initially. How long does it generally take the addict to be comfortable initiating and having sex? in a healthy manner with their spouse. I know it will uh, mm -hmm. greatly vary, but just generally. This is yeah, a lot like the first question, question. It is a different well, question. Well, it's a little it's different because mm -hmm. it's how, I mean, my hope is this person's got a lot of recovery and things are going well. And so at what point might we be sexual again, whether the is the addict or the partner? That's what I kind of read into this. And first of all, I don't think, I don't think that healing takes three to five years. I don't think it has anything to do with in 90 days, all this, and if I'm working really hard, it's specific to the individual, every single person. It took me, I'm going to stop years to stop doing what I was doing because I was so sick. Um, but some people get it right away and they get into therapy. But let me be really clear. Addiction is a lifelong 
challenge. The tracks for this were laid down when we were two, three, four, five, and six, whatever. And we're not going back there to fix that. So this is layered into the way our brain functions. When you say, why doesn't he want to have sex with me? It's because all these pieces in his brain that he doesn't even connect with up here is saying, watch out, watch out, this could be scary. And, and he doesn't know that. He just says, I'm reading the paper. So um, it's not three to five years. And Tammy and I can both tell you, having been working on ourselves, still, if you don't mind my saying this, Tammy, still going to therapy, still going to meetings. I've been doing this for over 30 years because I know that I am vulnerable. Uh, I had a therapist say, really quickly. I went to a therapist once and I, he's, I said, am I going to be in therapy forever? And he said, some people need support throughout the lifespan, which meant, yes, you're going to be in therapy forever. But the thing is, I didn't have parents. You know, I didn't have, I had crazy people growing up, growing up. I need the guidance of people in my life that can redirect me in ways. Okay. I answered that question. Second of all, you know, I think, first of all, I will say this to every partner, don't have sex with someone you don't trust. In fact, don't let someone you don't trust in your bed. Um, I think that's a really good idea, because if I said, you know, you know the neighbor, but how do you feel about getting in bed with you? You'd say, I don't trust them, you know, whatever. Don't sleep with people you don't trust, because if you are, then you're doing it for some other reason than how you feel about yourself. The other thing is, if you're both working on yourselves, you know, it doesn't start with sex. It starts with holding hands. It starts with going on dates. You really have to rediscover each other. Just like, you know, healthy dating is at the end point of something after a period of time, kissing, hugging, walking, you know, maybe a few months, we'd be sexual or whatever, maybe the first night, I don't know. But in this case, I think you have to take it slow. You have to protect yourself. And I don't mean take it three years before you have sex. I mean, when you start initiating connection, make sure you've initiated emotionally that you're really, you know, it has to come out of the connection between and then start with little pieces. Like you'll give him a bath or she'll, someone will comb her hair, or just little pieces that are intimate um, that don't necessarily lead to actual immediate sex. Because I don't think, if you think about the goal, it isn't to have sex. It's to grow a relationship around which sex might occur, you know? So anyway, I don't know, Tammy, do you have anything else? The only word I wanted to comment on was comfortable initiating those two words, because I was like, he, he may never be comfortable initiating, but like Dr. Rob was talking about, it's being willing, you know, at some point it's like, even like it, it, as addicts, like we are often uncomfortable because like, this is all foreign things. We'd rather run off and escape to something else. So, so learning to just do things um, and start being willing changes it. And then, you know, we gain some comfort with it, but, but to just be comfortable initiating, you know, and, and you could initiate, I mean, it's one of those things that it, it doesn't always have to be, you know, him, it doesn't always have to be you, you guys can figure it out. Um, but sensate focused uh, therapy, uh, uh, that's a, that might be a really useful place to start for the two of you. It's non general touching, but you know, you, it's a place to start. So Okay, ready? The next one is I'm ready. a betrayer, five months since discovery. I'm in a crisis and can't seem to be the person she wants me to be. I'm being honest and have read out of the doghouse. One of the most powerful things to me was that we both need to find emotional support and I can't seem to show her the way to find emotional support system outside of me. How can I guide her to into this thought without it seeming like I'm demanding it? You first. Oh my gosh, I was like, you can't do it. So- um, invite her to watch this video if she's not on right now. I have said to a lot of addicts, you know, because they're always like wanting to focus on her. And I'm like, oh, that's just a distraction. Um, like you work on you, like you becoming the trustworthy person. I'm glad that you um, read out of the doghouse and find, found it helpful. But, you know, it talks about what you need to do for you to become a trustworthy person and not go fix her because that's a really easy, oh, let me change the focus over to her. Her getting help, you know, it, like I mentioned, the support groups, we've got betrayed partner support groups, old lady posse on Tuesday morning, Wednesday afternoon, Thursday morning, uh, pro dependence aligned support for partners, Sunday night. So, those are places where she can come and get help. If she doesn't have a pro-dependent aligned support therapist, have her reach out to me, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. Include where you're located and I'll do my best to find her the right support person. There's, you know, there, there's so many resources. You are not support for her. She's really not the best support for you right now. You guys need support and uh, to heal separately and then eventually together. 
Yeah, I, I agree, Tammy. I think it starts separate. And, you know, a lot of us say we wait on couples therapy, except for setting boundaries and going through disclosure in the beginning, because, you know, in some ways, all partners say is you ruined my life. And all we say is I'm sorry. So we have to get past that part. Um, one of the words that came up for me is enmeshed. Um, sometimes I talk to couples who are like, oh, we love each other and everything's so great, except for this. And we, we still want to be around each other all the time and spend time with each other all the time. And I think, this is a couple that hasn't separated enough to really get in touch with what's, with what's really happened. Because if I were married to you and you'd done this to me, I don't think I would want to turn to you for your most for my emotional support. I think I'd like to kick you in the butt with a boot regularly. So unless that turned you on, which I guess I wouldn't, different story. But you understand the woman who wants to come to you for emotional support, who's also been betrayed, is not really um, allowing herself to feel that betrayal, to get angry, it's only been five months. And as was stated before, partners can be angry and hurt for a very long time. So part of what I'm thinking is, if you're a partner and you want things to just stay good and you wanna put that over there and that's the only thing and all of that, you might try to try to make it work in other areas. The other thing I was thinking is that maybe she's monitoring you. You know, Maybe she doesn't want you to be alone and so she's around you a lot because she wants to see what you're doing and, and make herself feel safe. But let me say this. First of all, Tammy, can you please tell us, because you say this all the time, where can people find these recordings? Uh, if they want to see more of us doing this, where can they find them? Sure. And I'll say it out loud because this is being recorded. So if you happen to find it on YouTube, but we have previously recorded webinars on sexandrelationshiphealing.com. Under the resource tab, you'll see previously recorded webinars. They're all there. Podcasts are on that same uh, website. There are so many resources on that website. It's probably a bit overwhelming, but we do have them categorized for partner, for the addict. There, we've been specific for couples. We've been very specific about putting things in hopefully the right bin to help you find them. And, and Sorry, I, I thank you, Tammy, because I hear you say it. And I'm like, I, I truly don't, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, oh, if I, because you said, maybe you want to listen to the one. And I thought, how would I find it? Where would I go? And they're free, by the way. You know, all that stuff is free. There was more and more thing about this, which um, I think that you get to sell. I feel like I could set boundaries with my partner like, and maybe this is part of the problem. You read a book that I wrote to make your partner feel better and to try to help them understand that you get it but it's only been five months. <laughs> and even though you may be practicing all of that, she's in la la land, pain, loss. You know, she's a lot, she hasn't even figured out what the heck's going on. She's still in shock. So you can do, you can dance on the head of a pin with everything I've ever said. And she's emotionally vulnerable and broken. And so, you know, I would give her some time. The other thing is boundaries. You know, if she says, you know, whatever it is, whatever you think this emotional support system is that she wants you to be. There's nothing wrong with saying to her, I love you, but I can't do that. You know, I love you, but I don't, you know, that's, uh, that's why I go to therapy or I love you, but, you know, set a boundary. Don't answer every one of her questions. Don't try to fix her. Let her struggle a little with her own stuff, not her feelings about you, what you did, but you can't fix her. And if she's turning you to ask her to fix her, then you need to explain to her that you can't in a loving way. We have lots of well, questions tonight. It, it, yeah, Tammy. no, I do, but and I'm um, I'm also thinking it's only been five months, and I'm glad you read out of the doghouse. But I don't hear, and here's the twelve steps I'm doing. Here's my therapist. Here's all the other things I'm doing because reading a book is great. But if I told an addict earlier today, if read, he was a smart guy, I could tell. And you know, I'm like, if reading a book was all we'd need, we would read one book and we'd all be fixed. And that's just not how it works. So, so if you guys are in crisis, I hear consistently from um, our alumni, but really from their partners that when the guys come to treatment, it can be life changing for the partners as well, because they start to see that you know, that change and transformation. So, so I would invite you to consider if that is a space that you are willing to, to step into, you know, investing 14 days with us to have it be well, on a different path is to me a good idea. But oh, what? Actually, let me say that to everybody, because now I have decided there's no fear in this. We run a treatment program that is residential. And I have had people on this group who've said, oh, I just went this place for treatment. And I'm thinking like, 
wait a minute, there is no more, I'm sorry to be arrogant, but there are very few experts at this level. Who, I don't think there are any experts at this level who are actively in some way working with your families. So if you want to go to, I just had someone to write me say, I want to go to the $65,000 treatment center. What do you think? And I thought, what do I think? I think you're, I think most of the people there I've trained. Well, you know that in terms of certain arenas. So um, I, do you hear my uh, frustration? I think I have. I'm because... with you. I had somebody called earlier today that was asking me for re refer to. I was like, why would you not want to get expert treatment? You know, but, you know, if you want experts. a swimming pool and you want to play tennis and you want to go, you know, and I don't mean to be insulting. They those folks, those places all do a lot of work, but I, I run treatment centers. I know who works there. You have the intern who's just you have the person who hasn't gotten the practice together yet. Um, maybe you've got someone who's been there for 40 years, but in treatment center, it, it's a, it's a burnout job. So um, as, I mean, the large ones where you got lots of people churning through and all that. So generally the really good people get in and then they get out, they get their hours. They, so, and I'll say one more thing that Tammy and I've talked about. Part of what we strive to do is be very articulated. If you need mental health, to be looked at, if you need drug issues to be looked at, if you've got a problem with your parents, I, mean, we're, I think it's really based on what that person needs. My experience in a lot of the larger programs, and I've created some, uh, although I would like to think they're better, is um, they're a little cookie cutter. You know, if you're a married man who has had an affair and been with three prostitutes and ruined your wife's life and wants to regain your family, we can probably help you with that. But pretty much more complicated cases, they're not so good at. And I've seen treatment centers a lot hand me a diagnosis that said he's love addicted, he's work addicted. I'm like, is he have depression? Does he, even, are, did you even look at mental health? So anyway, Tammy, I don't mean to go on and on, but I do want to really support the work we do. I'm very proud of it. And I think everyone is in that house right now. I know they are, uh, except the person, people who are new probably think, or what the heck am I doing here? But we got a bunch of guys who we're talking to right now, and they could tell you that they're growing as men and that they understand more than they ever have the responsibilities they have to partner their family. So they got it. Um, and that's what you want. You want them to get it. If they keep it, that's up to them. Okay, I'm done with the rant. Thank but you, Kathy. We provide support ongoing for that as well. So, so you and know, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, I, it drives me crazy. You know, I'm like, why wouldn't you want the best chance? I want, I am so beyond grateful for my recovery. Why would it, people not want the very best chance at moving forward in a different way? So anyway. And just to say it, since it's our site, we don't charge $60,000. We don't charge $20,000. So because we're in it for really helping people and not feeding some corporate system. So anyway. Okay. Let's take a Next breath. Next question. So sex addict here acting out has severely affected my wife's health, spirituality, emotionally, and physically. I'm watching her literally fade away. She is exhausted um, of the entire situation and is giving up. I want to help her a repeat of what we just said, but I've been told I cannot and she needs to heal on her own path. What's the best starting point for, and path for her to heal? You getting qualified help to be different. Her having support from a qualified right. pro-dependent line therapist, you know, her getting support with the old lady posse or the uh, pro-dependent support groups. I don't know her age, but you know, so whatever is the right fit, but you know, again, you focusing on her takes the work away from you doing your work. I, I want to add to that. And yes, I think every day that we can it's not punishment, it's humility that we get to stay with you. Every day is a demonstration on some level that we are working on ourselves. But I do wanna say something about this specific issue. Um, I remember when I ended a relationship that was very meaningful to me in my thirties and it was so devastating. Um, and I found myself walking along the beach and I didn't want to happen in my life and I was crying a lot. And I realized later that that stressful incident had pushed me into depression. And I didn't even know up to that point that I had depression. But the longer I, I mean, when I hear things like health, fade away, exhausted, I'm just picking out those terms. And, and I don't read stuff exactly like this very often. Overwhelmed, angry, you know, doesn't want to talk. I mean, that's more often. So my concern would be, you know, is she depressed? Um, in some way. And, and if she is, it makes it that much harder for him or her to simply get her shit together, no less try to work with you and figure this out. And so, you know, if you have, I think Tammy's absolutely right. She needs a professional. And in this case, I, I don't think whatever she needs is something you can give her. It isn't just, you know, I, I want you to know I'm recovering and here, you know, it's also, I'm concerned about her when I read this. That's, that's me as a therapist. So 
Okay, next question. Do sex addicts, after many years of acting out without there being any stress factors, meaning they are acting out out of pure enjoyment, example, having a variety of prostitutes? That doesn't ring true for me. So um, well, I think life is different full things. of stress factors and- um, They're so, different things. Yeah. I think, Please so do we act it. out, uh, uh, and by the way, there, you, there is no world without stress factors, okay? There are job stress, financial stress, and then there's COVID and what we're dealing with now, or we are under stress all the time. We don't live on farms, you know, with sheep. The urban life is stressful at, on every level. So you can't predict that, I'm, it doesn't have to be a stress like your mother died. Our, we act out after a fight with the boss. We act out when we get a, a raise. You know, we act out when any strong emotion hits us. So trust me, it isn't about no one's going to have any stress. The other piece is, um, yeah, we act out. I mean, of course we can act out. Um, so, I, I, okay, I don't act out. If I'm a sex addict, and I've really worked on this, I no longer get to go see a prostitute. I never go, I don't later get to think, oh, okay, I've been working on this a few years and now I can go to a strip club. And I think that's what you're asking in some way. There, this can never happen again. You know, it's like an alcoholic, I can't drink again. And so there is no pure enjoyment about going out with having casual sex, no matter what type, because I can't handle it. So I guess that's what I glean from that. It's a little confusing, but do you see anything else in there, Tammy, that I missed? No, I I was going with, you know, are they just doing this for pure enjoyment, you know? And I'm no. like, no, it's always, there's always some hole in the soul. There's some wound that we're looking to fill of, you know, but yeah, whether it's a happy occasion, a sad occasion, any strong emotion is like, oh, that's a good reason to act out. So, okay. My, my uh, SA husband just got, or I'm sorry. My essay husband got into S and M and his porn use and was seeking that in his live acting out when I discovered his addiction in 2019. He's in good recovery and we are working on reconnecting physically mm -hmm. with um, SRT. I don't want the S and M to be part of our relationship. My question is, if this is part of his arousal template, does that you know that does arouse him? Does that mean he needs it for his arousal? So this is a complex question, but I want to be really clear. You know, I have, I have a doctorate in human sexuality um, and I do know this stuff. So first of all, porn doesn't make us do things that we wouldn't have ordinarily be interested in on some level. I've heard a lot of people say to me, oh, the porn made me do it. You know, I never knew I was into, I don't know, panties or whatever until I watched panty porn. And then, can I say my thing, Tammy? <laughs> I don't want to say yeah. it directly. Oh, let me try it this way. I've seen a lot. I, I'm a gay guy, probably eight out of 10 on the gay side. I've seen a lot of images of women naked in all kinds of situations. And I have to say what I think about is, you know, what would look good on that body? Because I'm a homosexual. So no matter how much you show me the images, if it doesn't resonate inside of me, if it doesn't have a meaning or an excitement, I'm not going to be interested. So seeing something online and later saying, oh, I didn't, I, that the porn made me do it, or I wasn't into that. They may not be into it before the porn, but the porn revealed to them that this is a part that they actually had feelings about and wanted to engage in. So there's that, that's that piece. Second of all, it, what are you talking about is a fetish. You know, this man has a fetish around either being submissive or being dominant or, you know, all of that stuff. And we, you call it s &M. you know, fine. That is a fetish. A fetish is some outside experience that doesn't really have directly have to do with sex, but the person has brought it into sex. Like hitting is not necessarily part of sex, but they brought the hitting in because it excites them. Panties aren't a part of my sex life, but some guy might want to wear it. So we don't judge the fetish. He's into s &M, That's the way it goes. Your question though, is a very good question, which is, which has to do with dedicated versus non-dedicated. So there are people who have fetishes, panties, leather, urine, uh, uh, I don't know, I could come up with a bunch more, Tra trans, whatever it is, they have a particular fetish and they enjoy sex with their partner or someone else and they enjoy sex with the fetish. In other words, they can do both. There are people who are non-dedicated fetishists. They enjoy bringing the fetish into their relationship, but if it isn't there, that's fine. They enjoy having sex with their partner, but they still, it's part of them and they would still like to do it. So the question is, well, really not the question. The answer is you guys need to go to some therapy because this isn't going away. This is part of who he is. It's not sex addiction, even though it might've been uncovered during sex addiction. You know, I'm a sex addict, but I'm also gay and you can get rid of the sex addict, 
um, you know, there are people who are into whatever they're into and just because they're into that or even they acted out in an addictive way doesn't mean that it's gonna go away. This is not gonna change. The question you're asking is, does he get turned on with it, only with it, or can he get turned on with it or without it? I don't know the answer to that question. There is an answer to that question, but this is therapy stuff. Because if you want to remain married to someone who is into this, you may have to find some way to enjoy it with him. And that doesn't mean you're hitting him and beating him, or, but there has to be some kind of agreement because this is who he is. And I don't think there's a way around it. So I'm sorry he didn't marry you and tell you this or get a real, I'm sorry, maybe it didn't come along until 2019, but now it's there and now it ain't going away. And so the question is, how do you work this into your relationship in some way, whatever that means? And that's a therapy question in my mind. Okay, next question um, is- You work me like a dog, Tammy. I know this, but that was a <laughs> fascinating one. So thank you. Okay, they're all really good questions. I'm so can grateful you, that you guys show you, up all the time. Can you so. just shorten this next question? Okay. I don't think we have to go through the whole thing. I think yeah. it's pretty clear. Um, uh, my issue is the words victim and abuser. I know- I, I got it. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I know how to please. answer this question. Okay. So number one, I trained Dr. Manwala and he was my clinical director for a number of years. As I said, there are many people in the field that I haven't helped train at this age. Um, he has a different perspective on sex addiction and the issues that surround it than I believe most of the people in the field. He sees it much more as an offending behavior. He sees us as actively victimizing you, but not by letting you down. He sees it as a more aggressive act. And he sees us as sex offenders that have just been not diagnosed as sex offenders. I think to put that heavy weight on someone who has trauma and is sexual acting out from the beginning, like you're like an offender, is really not the, it's like a sentence. You know, what about, there are all different levels of the problem. There are all different levels of hurting someone or letting, letting them down. And some are more severe than others. But I think Dr. Mawala has a pretty fixed belief that of who we are as sex addicts and what our problem is and how and what and the reasons we're doing it. I don't think the research backs that up. I don't think anything that I tried to work with him around backs it up, but he has strong, strong beliefs about how much we are victimizing and abusing in an, in an conscious way. And I don't think that's true. I think when I go out, act out, I'm not thinking about you at all. And I don't think it has to do with deliberately trying to hurt you or let you down because it's about me. Anyway, I'm not a big fan of this particular clinician because I don't agree with the way he, I think it, this can be very hurt. How may I say this? We've had a lot of couples come up here where someone says, well, I'm being told that he's a sex offender or I'm being told that, you know, and I just, I think it's a little out of the ballpark for me. But, you know, as we say, take what you like and leave the rest. Tammy? And I need to tag on to that because I don't feel like there's a place of healing to move forward if, if that person is always, they're an offender and abuser, and I'm always the victim. And, you know, we really want to work on healing relationships if, you know, if there's a path for healing, but when you put those things in, you did this to me and you were always bad because you are always the offense rather than looking at, gosh, that person is really broken. And what's the underlying reasons? What happened? Why is this happening? And how can we move forward in a different way? That to me is a healing path. So, so I much, per, I don't use those terms. I mean, there is sex offenders, you know, we, we talk about those as well. So, um, uh, so, so somebody put in the chat and I would like you to address this one before we move on to, they said, um, I think you should be careful at calling trans a fetish. I think that yeah, you're right. Aligned. That was my, so, that was my yeah, error. He's yeah, absolutely yeah. right. I wasn't yeah. thinking about, it's just what came out of my mouth, but they are absolutely right. Um, it's not a fetish. It's who you are. And um, although I think there are men who fetishize clothing, who fetishize, I, I've seen men fetishize women's clothes, but they're not necessarily interested. So, but you're absolutely right. And I apologize. It, it's not only be careful, I was wrong. So thank you. Yes. So I, I thanks for calling that be, up, Tammy. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. I wanted that one addressed on the tape. So um, I unfortunately made a bad choice and had an affair. I ended it three weeks ago. I feel like I'm not in love with my husband anymore, but I'm not sure it's an uh, affair fog. Is this common to feel this way during and after an affair? Well, um, affair, you know, we talked about that intensity earlier that people sometimes seek intensity rather than intimacy. And what happens in the beginning of an affair is, you know, it's like 
dating someone new who's wonderful. It's all starlight and moonbeams. And it's like West Side Story. You're floating across the room toward each other and you can't stop telling your friends about them. And, you know, that is a part of our natural bonding process between two people. So um, your question is, you know, is well asked, which to me, you're still riding on the, um, the emotions around the affair. And if you expect your feelings for your husband to be anything like that, then you're missing the boat. Um, I think adult married relationships are about deep connection and companionship and supporting each other and being there no matter what and owning your stuff and, you know, all of that, you know, Tim, I have to say like, and maybe it's just me, but because it's sex addiction, because it's sexual, you know, I think both partners and addicts, especially the addicts, put way too much focus on, on sex. You know, we've both been married a long time. I think I won't say about your life, but I would say that 94% of my life is not about sex. And maybe when I was 40, maybe 70% of my life in terms of a marital relationship. So a lot of folks have this idea that, well, when we work this out, we're gonna have a lot more sex. Or if we don't have a lot of sex, it means it's not working. Or if we don't have a sex, a lot of sex, that means I don't love you anymore. Um, you know, what I would ask you to think about is what if you walked out the door and you never saw him again? That would be a better thing that I would think about rather than what you're feeling. I would look at the end point of what you're going through because what you're saying is, do I want to be with him? And I don't even know where that comes from. So I don't know, Tammy, that's my response. Well, I was thinking, you know, I think being in a long-term relationship is a commitment and the feelings ebb and flow, you know? Um, I also think that the, I'm, I don't feel like I'm in love, you know, and I like, it's that whole starlight and intensity. And, you know, I think, personally, that's why the divorce rate is so high is people go, oh, I don't feel it anymore. And so I'm going to move on and get feel it again. And then, I, you know, so it's that recycling of, of things. So, um, so I think what Dr. Rob said about, you know, if he walked out the door and you never saw him again, is that, a, you know, is that what you want? Um, I, I appreciate that you said I made a really bad choice and had an affair. So, you know, if at the end of the day, you're not supposed to be in a relationship with your husband anymore, at least make, you don't, and we hear all the time from people that are hurt because of the betrayal. So, you know, if you're not going to be in a relationship or, I mean, if you want to leave that relationship, leave the relationship, have the integrity to leave the relationship, you know, and then pursue whatever it is you're going to pursue. I want to say one more thing, which is when we have an affair, if you're sane, Okay, if you're sane, in order for us to sexually acting out, have affairs, whatever, we have to minimize our connection to our partners in our mind. They won't know, it won't matter, we'll get away with, you know, whatever it is. And then to turn back to them, we've been saying so many nasty things about them in our head in order to feel entitled to act out that to really return and see you as the full person is to, it can be challenging for us to fully allow ourselves to see you that way because we put you down for so long in so many ways. But there's one other thing I wanted to say about this. You know, if you, okay, I know what I want to say. If you chose to have an affair, I'm glad you cut it off. But people who have affairs, if they're not regular like sex addicts, then maybe you had a lot of stuff you wanted to say to him. Maybe there's some emotional issues that you didn't do with because if you turn to the affair and another person rather than directly saying to your husband, I'm not happy, I'm struggling, you know, then you, Take, you take the intimacy out of the relationship. So by having an affair, you don't really deal with the issues with your husband. And then you come back to the relationship. They're still not dealt with, you know, because uh, you went and did that for a reason. And if you're not a sex addict, you went and did it because there's something you're really unhappy about or not resolving or keeps coming up. Those are therapy issues. Um, and by the way, if you stay with him, he's going to have to learn about the affair at some point. So the next is a really interesting and good question. My spouse went to SI earlier this year. My spouse checks in with me and does a group or two a week. While his time with treatment seems to have helped him be aware of his bad behavior, but I was expecting a bigger change. He still has the same friends. He still has the same business partner he conspired with for them to have sex with different women each. We have discussed this several times. How long should it take him to cut ties with the business partner or should he? Well, I can just tell you what we do in treatment. If I had a client who come into treatment and he said, you know, I love my spouse or she, well, we don't see women. So I, I, I sorry, guys, I would love, you know, I love my spouse, but, um, but um, I'm going to say what I was going to say, but, um, but, you know, I'm not going to give up what I'm doing, you know, in the afternoons, or I'm not going to give up that golf game with the guys, or I'm not going to give up 
you know, working at this place, even though I had an affair with the woman who works there. And here's the thing, and I want to say this directly to you. Um, it's up to you. It's up to you. Um, if it were me, I would say, if you continue with those friends, here's, you know, here's a hotel you can stay at. I mean, I think it's really about you to say, you know, at a certain point you have to say, this isn't acceptable to me. And if someone went to our program, feel free to put them on the line and I'll be glad to tell them what we would have said when they were with us, which is, um, this isn't about having your cake and eating it too. And sometimes recovery is difficult. Tammy knows there are drug addicts who have, or alcoholics who have to give up everyone they ever knew because everyone they ever knew led back to their drug addiction. They had to start all over again. This is why we go to 12-step programs, by the way, to meet the right people who are going to support us. So I don't care if they're friends from high school or friends from college or someone he knew is, you know, new from work. If he loves you and he wants to respect you and your marriage or relationship is more important to him, then he will push this aside. And if he doesn't, I think that's very good information for you about whether this is a relationship you want to stay in. Because ultimately, if he decides that hanging out with the friends who make you so uncomfortable and having the same business partner, if that leaves you really uncomfortable, it's his decision. Does he want to continue to make you uncomfortable or does he want to stop? But your decision is how long do I want to live with this or do I want to let this go no matter where it ends us? That was hard. What to I don't hear. Out. Yeah. What I don't hear is, you know, he's seeing his qualified therapist. He's doing group therapy. He's doing, is he doing the alumni meeting with our, every week, the guys are online doing the alumni week or alumni Like group. 50, like 50 yeah, of them. Yeah. And, um, I, and so I don't hear any of those type of things. What I hear is, oh, check. I went to treatment. Oh, check. I'm doing a couple groups. Oh, check. I'm checking in with my spouse, but I don't hear, I don't hear any real change. It's like, you know, he, he. He made a few changes, you know, you see some changes, but I also hear this is as much as I did. In 12 step, we have a half measures availed us nothing. So, so doing just a little bit, you know, only does a little bit. So, so he isn't, uh, in my opinion, and this is just what you're sharing, you know, he's still early in recovery because if it's just this year, we're only into May, but, but on the other hand, you know, if he's actively engaging in his recovery, then he's doing a lot more than a couple groups a week and, you know, and checking in with you, uh, you know, and going to treatment for two weeks. You know, we, we are a great treatment program, but we don't fix everything in 14 days. I really have to commit what my priorities are. You know, is my priority my marriage or is it still doing the things that I enjoy and just skating across the surface? To me, for you, this seems insulting, abusive. You shouldn't have to ask for this. You can just simply say, I'm not comfortable with it. And if he wants to be with you, his job is to say, right, I get it. I, I, I've had people give up businesses and move because they're so entrenched in their behavior because they wanted to save their marriage and their family or their kids, or he has to decide, but I don't know any addicts who come get help or change their behavior unless they're in pain. Pain is unfortunately one of the few motivators we have for addicts. And as long as he's comfortable with you and you're just a little upset or annoyed, but he gets to do what he wants to do, that's not gonna work. You're gonna have to set a boundary that is that clearly and, and, and succinctly explains to him what he has to lose if he continues that behavior. And by the way, send him back to me for a week. I'll kick, Never mind. I don't want to say those first. <laughs> Go ahead, Tammy. Okay, so time for one more? Sure. Okay. So this one is long. So let's see. After 40 years of masturbating to porn and being caught the second time by my wife, I'm really trying hard to do all the right things. I'm seeing a CSAT, SA meeting sponsor, 12 steps, reading a lot. Uh, sticking to my abstinence list and daily check-ins to improve communications and working hard to adhere to boundaries. Um, I cannot possibly understand her betrayal, pain, and anger caused, caused my wife. I do know in my heart that I deeply remorseful for my horrific behavior. I feel like the biggest piece of crap with guilt and shame for the trauma I've caused. I can now clearly understand the wreckage I've caused, suffering the consequences of my actions, come to terms with the selfish, isolated man I am who does not know to attach and be intimate and never want to hurt my family again. <laughs> I'm 90 days sober and feel good about my recovery and not acting out ever. She says there is no hope for my recovery, that I'm too damaged and messed up. Can you give me words of hope for us addicts? That's a lot. Well, there's an awful lot in here. Um, there's two pieces I hear. Number one, this person is way too in their head because they're smart and they get all of this. It's like they 
cut stuff from a book and put it in there. I mean, this isn't to me, somebody who's saying, I don't know what to do. I'm overwhelmed. It sounds like someone has a lot of the answers, but maybe they're up here and not down here because 90 days is, is brand new. It's brand new. I mean, I, anyway, I won't say how long I struggle with, but it's brand new. He doesn't even know which way is up and down. And so, and what reason at 90 days would she have any hope for you? And by the way, you are damaged and messed up, or you wouldn't be in this situation. Tammy, I know we had someone that was working with me really insulted because I used the word broken. And it was interesting because this man was saying exactly what you are. I'm a piece of crap. I hate myself. I'm a terrible person. And I said, well, what if you're not a bad person? What if you're just a broken person who doesn't know how to be intimate, who doesn't? Now, I don't do that to make people feel like, you know, they can take a pill and be better, but I'm trying to reduce shame. And that's the other piece that I react to here. When you said, uh, I wrote this down, I'm a selfish piece of crap. That ain't it. While you were thinking about, I'm so awful and I did all these things and what's wrong with me and I'm such a terrible person. Who could do this to their family? Guess what that's all about? You. you. While you're ruminating about how terrible you are, you're missing the opportunity to think, I wonder what she's going through. And I don't think, by the way, on any level, watch Ray, Rob get more passionate here. I, on no level, could you imagine the wreckage you've caused? There's no way. What I hear is you'd like to make it better right now. And you're going to be the best boy in the world to try to, make, you know, what you need to do is let her have her space and be in pain for a long time. And I'll say this last thing that I say to every spouse and every spouseless group. Spouses, you have three things to do in the first year, to, provided we're doing what we're supposed to do. And this is it. One, to be very angry with us for a long time. Number two, during the first year to decide whether or not you want to stay with us. And number three, a tremendous amount of self-care and support and nurturing. Nowhere in that does it say forgive him or her. Nowhere in there does it say get ready to move on with your life. His partners need a year to figure out if they even want to be with us. And that's a good time for us to be doing what we're supposed to be doing so they can begin to ease their anxieties and fears. Uh, you think in 90 days, she's going to think of anything but you're a motherfucker and I hate your guts. They say, I knew I knew use that language. Um, you're you're not getting her pain if you think that this should be going better at this point. Tammy, it's an honor. Love to see you. My favorite thing to do with you during the week, I have to say. Thank you. Thank you all for the great questions. We'll be back next week. Thanks, everybody. And guys, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you there tomorrow you in treatment. Okay. Bye-bye.